Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us Jairaman and Tejal Kanitkar, both from Tata Institute of Social Sciences, who have, who have been working on the climate change issues for quite some time. Good to have both of you with us. Jairaman, starting with the Paris Accord. Now, two major issues which are of concern to all of us. A, is this accord enough to stop global warming or significant amounts of global warming? A and B, what is its implication for equity issue? The accepted target uh, in words in the Paris Agreement, and this is not even new, this has been going restated every time since Copenhagen. We are, the world is supposed to try and keep the increase in temperature above pre-industrial levels to 2 degrees centigrade. So, the maximum rise is supposed to be restricted to 2 degrees centigrade, centigrade, but that is the from a certain year. What is that year? The year uh, conventionally is taken to be between 1850 and 1870. It is the average from that period. So, what is it today? If we Before we go into the future, what is it today? It, today, it is almost 1 degree centigrade uh, since uh, the 1850 period. So, we already have lost half of the supposed margin that we are supposed to have. So, 2 degrees out of that 1 degree is already lost. The target is still supposed to be 2 degrees centigrade, but the Paris Accord does not acknowledge in any way the means by which this target is to be achieved. In fact, it papers over the seriousness of the situation, namely we are currently set not to 2 degrees centigrade, but well over 2, possibly 2.5, 2.7 and by some estimates maybe even 3. So, we are able to estimate this for the following reason. One of the new climate science results, which we have really come to know over the last uh, three years, is that if you want to have a temperature target, meaning you do not want to cross a certain limit in temperature increase, then you have to ensure that the total emissions, greenhouse gas emissions from the earth as a whole are limited to a certain number. That is a carbon budget. So, you can spend it earlier or later, but you cannot exceed the carbon budget over a certain period. Over a certain period. If you exceed it, temperature will rise. So, this budget is also because of the uncertainties in estimating climate science it has a probability attached to it. So, if you want a greater chance of staying below say 2 degrees centigrade, you have to emit less. If you emit more, the chances of your crossing 2 degrees centigrade are correspondingly greater. So, the numbers are very easy to remember. So, between now and also actually 3 years ago, and the end of the century for a 50, 50 or for really for a 33 percent chance of crossing 2 degrees centigrade, the total carbon dioxide that the world can emit is 1000 billion tons of carbon dioxide. So, currently including the promises that the developed countries and others have made at uh, uh, in terms of emissions reduction that they have made at Paris, which will become official as the years go by. This amounts to spending 542 billion tons out of this 1000 billion by 2025 in the next 10 years. And in fact, given the rate at which emissions are continuing, by 2030, 748 billion tons would have been emitted. 75 percent of the 75 percent is gone. Tejan, you have looked at the promises made by different countries during the negotiations, what is now being called a bottom-up pledge. 
That means we do not have a total target. We do not try to work out from the total target what would be the portion that each country has to emit or cut. But we say, please make pledges and let's add all of it up and see whether it works to what we want. So between the pledges and what we, are, what we need, how much is the gap and where are this going to take us? But like Jairaman just said, the gap is uh, What do you think are the, you know, if we add the pledges, where do you think we stand? But the pledges amount to a temperature rise by some estimates of 2.7 degrees Celsius, by others at about 3.1 degrees Celsius. But uh, this is by what time? By 2100, by 2100. the end of this year, yeah, by 2100. And uh, um, if you look at the Paris Agreement, it not only pledge, it not only commits to trying to keep temperature rise to well below 2 degrees Celsius, but also considers a 1.5 degree Celsius temperature target. That means not a rise of 2 degrees Celsius, but a rise of 1.5 degrees Celsius as a goal that should be pursued by the world as a whole. Now, if you take that target, and that target was meant to uh, allay the fears of a lot of the small, more vulnerable countries uh, who are going to suffer greatly if there is a temperature rise of 2 degrees Celsius. So, that 1.5 degrees Celsius goal is not at all possible to meet because the budget that is implied by even for a fair 50-50% chance of meeting that 1.5 degrees Celsius temperature rise will be exhausted by 2030. By 2030 so, that 30 will be itself. exhausted. The budget that is available till 2100 will be exhausted completely or more than exhausted by 2030. Which means there's only about 15 years. You can only assume that you've, we've, uh, the, our political leaders have hedged the future of the planet on some hopes of having some carbon removal technologies available in the future, which don't currently exist at all. So why would you consider that this climate change agreement at least has one benefit, it has brought everybody to an agreement, the first time Americans have at least agreed to something. But uh, the problem with that is uh, the uh, getting the Americans on board seems to, you know, the price seems to be the safety of the planet. And that is really very problematic. So, uh, at Durban, three years ago, when the decision was taken that we that by 2015, a global agreement would be signed. If you look at the wording of that original resolution, it's so powerful. In fact, it even dismissed the equity a concern, which is very important for developing countries, particularly including India, even dismissed that to say that a legally binding commitment to restrict emission so that we can stay below 2 degrees centigrade is the goal. But then the Americans took control of the ship. It happened slowly through the last three years, accelerated in 2015. And so we have an agreement that is not pinned to anything concrete, not in terms of target, not in terms of the means to implement it, not in terms of what will happen in the future. So, the American leadership, which was fully manifest in Paris, has been disastrous for the planet. You know, the other issue that is, that is actually important is that energy costs, in some sense, becomes also a global trade issue. That if my energy cost is high, your energy cost is low, then I can trade goods uh, at a disadvantage, I trade goods at a disadvantage. So, this becomes in that sense a part of the larger economic debate. But lately, the energy cost from renewables has dropped drastically. In fact, the last uh, tendered uh, solar uh, project in India has seen, seen tariffs which are almost comparable to coal fired plants. So, given this and given the fact that US really has a lot of renewable resources available to it, don't you think that actually there is uh, today a much greater ground to believe that if we take a turn away from fossil fuels, the costs to the global economy is that not that much, nor are the differential costs very high. Well, while there is a lot of reason to be optimistic about the reducing costs of renewable energies, uh, it is also true that it, it has happened in a situation where there is a lot of support 
public support uh, for renewable energy systems. The latest costs for in, in India where solar costs had really dropped were at uh, were because in part uh, of very low rates of interest uh, for the loan that uh, was required whereas for coal or th other thermal power plants the rates of interest are still quite high. So we still do not have parity in terms of costs between coal and solar. I also think it is not just about uh, energy costs per se but also the quantum of investments required that uh, is important especially for developing countries. Uh, maybe less so for uh, the developed countries and that that's is why. That is why my question really was yes, the United the States yes. that there is a issue, twofold issue of energy. One is a capital cost involved and obviously capital scarce countries which are the developing countries have a problem unless financial flows do take place to other parts of the world. So that becomes a part of the equity debate. For developed countries which who have the money, in fact the basic problem is they do not know how to invest that money and that is the reason that you have a financial uh, crisis in the West. For them the costs of energy in fact are the determinant factor not so much the capital cost. And that is why it is very strange the US still persists, persists with 600,000 megawatts of fossil fuel in, uh, installed capacity which is quite old which is about 30, 40 years old but will not shift to renewables in a significant way which would help the globe and also not put a, a, a very big cost on it. Uh, I must say as uh, Dr. Sunita Narayan I think correctly pointed out, it is an extraordinarily pliant media that refuses to ask hard questions. So for instance, the International Energy Agency has publicly released its annual energy report and in the headlined findings of the report and they have really headlined it for the media for easy consumption is that the United States produced more oil last year than Saudi Arabia. But at Paris, Saudi Arabia is the villain. Saudi Arabia makes money out of royalty on oil which is pumped by the big uh, corporations headquartered in uh, the developed countries and uh, it fuels their uh, energy systems. So why is Saudi Arabia the villain? The other villain in the beginning, uh, the first week of Paris, they tried to pin coal on India. Coming back to the issue of equity which is the other issue which concerns all the you know developing countries, equity has virtually been buried in the Paris Agreement because as it stands we are going to look forward and not backwards which means historical responsibility has been given up. It is bottom up so each country will do whatever it wants so there is no prescriptive mechanism to see that those who have created the problem. 75 percent of the climate carbon emissions in the atmosphere still belong to the developing developed countries. That this does not seem to be uh, at all in, on the agenda anymore. There are two points to note about equity. One is very carefully all the wordage, all the wording related to equity has been kept in the text. At Durban there was no reference to equity a common but differentiated responsibility. In the de Paris decision and the Paris agreement, it is peppered relatively speaking all over the place. So the words are there, but what about the substance? That is why I said the prescriptive mechanism. So there is no mechanism. Not only is there no mechanism, but you see if there is a fixed budget for the world and everybody has to live within it. And then you say, we will all do it voluntarily, I will do my best, huh? I will keep emitting, I will do my best to reduce it. So this actually allows the big uh, emitters, okay, the developed countries mainly, to continue their grabbing of carbon space. So in terms of equity, despite all the wording that you see in the agreement, it has actually sanctified for 5, for 10, for 15, we do not know, okay, depends how it future evolves, a continuing carbon grab by 
uh, the developed countries. So we are back to what used to be the, called the grandfathering principle. Absolutely. I have taken over a part of the carbon space of the world. I continue therefore historically to take over larger spaces because this is what I already had. So this is in some sense a enclosure argument. Just to add to that, uh, if you look at the uh, aspect of differentiation and uh, this was quite evident even leading up to Paris and all the uh, documents that were submitted by different countries. The differentiation on the basis of equity and historical responsibility was reflected quite strongly in the submissions of developing countries, India, China, Brazil. Uh, if you also Bolivia, 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 and, Bolivia and the others. But uh, if you look at uh, submissions of, from developed countries, they had differentiation. Equity didn't appear anywhere. They had differentiation, but differentiation on the basis of national circumstances not on the basis of equity, not on the basis of historical responsibility. And that is what their formulation of differentiation is what has survived in the agreement. Yeah, but I think about equity, I think there is another point which should be made quite uh, clearly and I think uh, perhaps is not acknowledged enough in uh, India. You know, we have not successive governments from India and this is true of most uh, third world countries have not put forward a concrete proposal on equity. So this is the TIS Delhi Science Forum model which we had developed, exactly. which tried to apportion uh, shares based on certain principles including exactly. equity and historical responsibility. You know, coming back to India's role in this, would we say that India really did not successfully uh, influence the outcome except only in terms of some language but really the substantive issues India really didn't play any significant role and this as you phrase it is a victory for the United States and its vision? Uh, largely speaking yes. I would say uh, that as uh, some people call it you know the optics of it you know the impression that you project was uh, positive in the first weeks. There was a constant emphasis on uh, the need for carbon space for development which was very welcome earlier uh, occasions they were always reluctant to articulate it in those terms it was repeatedly articulated but then there is no point in articulating and the articulation begins two weeks before Paris. So if you have uh, if you want to put the money where your mouth is then I think uh, there would have been much greater engagement and we should have stood our ground. The uh, specifics that would have been beneficial to India was actually put there first by Bolivia. India supported it and this I am aware and this I think should be said on record. But when it was dropped from the, uh, the draft agreement that comes out of the COP presidency in the second week which is sort of leads the way to the final agreement. These wordings on the equitable distribution of the carbon budget, the key requirement for India were dropped. Now India did not take the lead at that point in demanding its reinstatement. Okay. Last question. Here we are facing an exhaustion of the carbon budget by 20. 35, 40, if we go like this, based on the pledges made. So what is the advice to the global movements? What is it they should do in order to force a favorable outcome of the climate change debate? I think there are uh, several things, uh, but uh, what are the headlines? I think we need to first appreciate that the world is on a carbon diet. I think this still has not gotten through to people and this must be hammered home by the movement everywhere. You must ask questions, whatever it is you do, what is it in terms of the total diet the world is supposed to observe? What and exposing those, those who are those denying who, climate change. Who are denying it. So that is the first. The second is the exposure of the so called voluntary bottom up approach portraying it as if it is something democratic among the nations of the world when in fact it is unashamed carbon grab. I think this is important. 
The third is, I think, very important for the global movement that when they are against coal, when they are against oil in the developed countries, they should not extend it to saying that developing countries should also do identical things. Developing countries will have a hard enough time ahead of them, India in particular, Africa also. But nevertheless, this uh, tendency we see in this coal divestment movement of a uniform sort of divestment in coal across the globe is incorrect. In fact, the first uh, project to lose money is in Bangladesh. So, that they must learn to differentiate between the needs of developed and developing countries. We will continue to discuss these issues because climate change is going to be with us, with you and with NewsClick for, for the future. Thank you very much for coming down to NewsClick. Hope to continue this discussion further. Thank you.